wrote a great article. I want to just make sure that this is the one we're talking about. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. You raised two main topics in the article. Uh, the first was that each step in the evolution of HT came with uh, resistance and battles, but finally became the standard, which I completely agree with. And the five points that you cited um, are still applicable today. So it went from plug harvesting to strip harvesting, naked eye to microscope, small sessions to mega sessions. Remember that? Remember when 500 was considered a lot? Sure. Now you're hearing 3,500 as a daily you know, event. Uh, mini graphs to follicular units and multiple stack scars as compared to just one long uh, linear FUT scar. And I agree with all of that, but it was the second topic that really caught my attention. And of course, it was the bulk of your article. Um, that centered around the practice of FUE. And what you, what you talked about is that um, the first is that Non-hair transplant specialists were now buying FUE machines and getting into the hair transplant business. Why is this a problem to your mind? Well, because patients are going to be home. And those of us that are ethical in the field have always, no matter what we do, it's always about patient, the patient outcome. I'm not no serum, right? So when, and we know in the field of hair restoration that it's not a simple procedure and then so many things can go wrong. And it takes years to, to master this. So if I sell you a very expensive hammer that doesn't make you a carpenter, uh, doctors who just want to make a lot of money buy into this concept, oh, it's just a simple little thing, then we know that patients are going to be hard. Even experienced doctors sometimes make mistakes with hair lines or over hearts. Uh, when an inexperienced then doctor turns it over to people that should not be doing this, we know there's going to be patient harm, and patient harm is going to affect me as well. It doesn't help us at all if there are unhappy patients walking around. That's going to hurt us all. We want, I don't mind the competition. I want good competition, well-trained competition, competent, caring, and ethical competition. Completely yeah. agree with you. We've, we've noticed the same thing, that when another doctor does bad work, it does affect us. It is not an advantage to say, oh, everybody's doing this horrible job, but we do it right. That doesn't work well at all. I believe that there's far more hair transplant, or I should say far more potential hair transplant patients out there than there are quality doctors who can handle them. The problem is, is that there's a lot of um, confusion on the internet from people who are not performing it to at least the minimums that ISHRS members always used to perform to because a lot of these members, as, a lot of these practitioners, as you mentioned, are not even ISHRS members. Which brings me to the second concern I had. You said that some or many of these non-specialists, most of which aren't in the ISHRS, I'll point out, and you pointed that out in your article, are allowing medical assistants who are not medical doctors to perform these uh, surgical FUE procedures. Why do you think this is a problem? Well, it's, it's a function of, you know, we know that a follicular leader extraction is a surgical procedure but it's the tiniest surgical procedure probably in medicine. And therefore, it is possible for someone who's not a licensed individual to learn how to do it. And since they work for less money, there's an economic motive. So it makes good business sense to turn over a task to the cheapest person you can turn it over to, even though that's illegal and inappropriate. And again, it dumbs down the field and patients are going to be harmed. And there always have been and always will be unethical practitioners. but. An open heart surgeon can't turn that over to a medical assistant. It just can't be done. Uh, nor would a big excision ever be done. That's what protected strip procedures. That part of the procedure with real surgery, we're using scalpels to make a big wound in the head. There's no joke. And nobody else is going to do that. Uh, making sites, though, <clears throat> a much more minor surgical procedure, still a surgical procedure. And so it's possible to delegate these to people that you shouldn't be delegating to. And you need to resist that, even though it's, there's an economic consequence to doing it correctly. And do you think this is happening in the United States? It's happening, you know, 300 yards from my office. Mm. It, whereas uh, several years ago, you know, there were very few hair transplant surgeons. The, there were people that devoted their time to it, maybe not as well as others, but they were hair transplant surgeons. But there are three plastic surgeons in my area that recently went to the neograph model and they are not doing the procedures themselves. Uh, they're um, you know, licensed individuals, I know that. Were these doctors practicing uh, hair transplantation as a specialty the way we do? Or were they just, did they just add on hair transplants 
because it was supposedly facilitated through the use of certain equipment that's on the market. That's right. The, the flyers, we all receive them, you know, stop sending your hair transplant patients to other doctors. It's quick and easy to make this money yourself. You don't have to know anything about hair transplant surgery. Mm -hmm. Buy our piece of equipment. We will send you the staff. You just have to put, put your head in there and wave hello. <laughs> and that's the marketing approach. And so these doctors that used to send patients to me, now they're, they're saying, oh, why should I do that? I'll just do it myself without realizing how complex the procedure is and how easy it is to cause harm. And you think that many of these doctors, I happen to believe most, are delegating the procedure in part or in whole to non-doctor um, staff? I don't think there's any way that they could be doing it any other way because they have no training. They're not members of the hair society. They've never been to a hair meeting. There's no way that they would have the skills to do it themselves. They have to delegate it. These are fine plastic surgeons that are capable of doing many things, but just because you're an expert at one thing does not mean you're an expert at something else. So if they want to take, to take the time and go to some meetings and do some training, they could come to my office and I would be happy to train them. But they don't do that. They just want a quick buck. And their training is outside the, the world of, of the good, competent training that you and I take advantage of all the time. And whereas before, you and I might disagree about something and we might butt heads. Eventually, one of us is going to convince the other because we're both ethical and we're going to go down that pathway. But these guys are not having any interaction with us. They're yes. being by different outfits with a whole different, it's a purely profit-driven mindset. So they don't have access to competent, conscientious, and caring doctors learning the other ways of doing something correctly. Some of the FUE-only doctors I've run into, not only uh, are they incommunicative, they're also combative. They don't want to get into a debate. I've tried. I've tried in online forums. They will not get into a, uh, they will not, they will enter a debate, but they will not debate. They, they will just hurl um, criticisms and statements and distractors and anything they can not to answer the salient questions. With respect to the performance of FUE, where do you think it belongs in the hair transplant hierarchy? That means, should it be used in place of FUT? Is FUT dead? What are your thoughts? Uh, definitely not. I, it, they, they both have a definite place, and, uh, and a complete surgeon will be able to do both and be able to do both well. Uh, my personal belief is that if we can, we should take the best hairs in the scalp, and that's in the traditional safe zone. Uh, and many of my patients, that's all they need. But, you know, every strip surgeon knows that it's not possible to harvest every uh, graft from the safe zone. The scalp just becomes too tight sometimes, and the patient still needs more hair. The only way to get hairs at that point is FUE. Agreed. Uh, and even the safe zone is not 100% safe. We know that a variety of conditions can... Uh, whether it's retrograde alopecia or senile alopecia or whatever, can impact that, that safe zone. So having another tool, another skill set is very, very important. The combination, uh, the ability to do strip and FUE, and not necessarily in that order, but in my, my practice, it's strip first and then typically followed by FUE, is very important. Then we can give our patients the most numbers of crafts. And so long as we are honest with the patient about what hairs we're taking and where we're taking the risks of each of the areas, then, then, we're, then we're practicing in an ethical way and taking care of our patients well. I could not agree yeah. more. Uh, I mean, that, that says it all right there. You would be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised, at how many doctors are not saying those words. Do you think that FUE should be used for mega sessions on a regular basis? So I think that's very, very dangerous. And uh, the use of mega sessions with the FUE almost always results in significant donor depletion. And, uh, you know, I was in Brazil recently and seeing all sorts of presentations and, 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 and whatnot. And there is this, almost nobody gets less than 3,000 grafts now. I've seen grafts harvested from within a centimeter of the recipient area. So you're basically, you're just moving a graft one centimeter. Right. Uh, taking all these hairs out. So this, this desire to take more and more and more out uh, just to make our numbers is, is very risky. And I think we're starting to see now the backlash of significant donor depletion, uh, which is very difficult to fix when it's when it's at the hands of, it, of FUE. And that's not publicized. You know, one of the things that we're up against is marketing. So these instrument manufacturers, the machine manufacturers, have millions and millions of dollars, which is why they can market in, the, in, the, in every single airline magazine. You and I can't afford to do that. So the good messages don't get out there, but those messages do. 
and they don't put those bad, depleted FUE cases up there on the airline magazine. It's just a, you know, a scar. As you talked about donor depletion, I know uh, Dr. Paul Rose has actually started to give presentations on the dangers and empirically explain why that is an issue. Uh, up until fairly recently, uh, the, the general, cons well, I won't say consensus, the, ger the general claim by FUE only doctors is that you can take 50% of the donor area before you notice this donor depletion. Do you believe that? Uh, no, I, I don't believe that. And then remember also that a lot of those graphs are being taken from very risky areas. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to talk about not safe donor area, what people then call the safer donor area, but low risk, medium risk, and high risk areas that we can harvest depending on where in the scalp we're harvesting. And if, we're, if we aren't harvesting uniformly throughout the entire potential donor area, including well inside and well outside the traditional safe zone, some of those hairs are going to disappear over time where they're, where they're being placed, and that's an additional problem. So we know that, in theory, 50%. But the reality is I'm seeing people harvest way more than 50% very, very quickly with the mega session FUE cases. I agree. I've, I've yeah. actually seen patients with far less than 50% harvesting or at least attempted harvesting and they still have significant donor depletion, which Dr. Paul Rose described as voids. Uh, he made up a, um, a, a sort of a new term, an FU void, and it's sort of like the concept of zero in the donor area, which is, as I'm primarily a strip surgeon, as you know, I've been doing FUE since the beginning, but um, I noticed that um, the donor area begins to look depleted rather quickly. Uh, when you start to get past five or 600 grafts, you begin to see donor depletion occurring. Whereas, I mean, you do it as an FUT, you wouldn't notice anything. You wouldn't notice, there is no way a human being could notice a drop in concentration in the donor area when an FUT case is performed as compared to an FUE case. But as far, that's a donor area. What about as far as the grafts themselves? Do you think that FUE grafts uh, come out as safely as FUT graphs, and do you think they grow as well as FUT graphs in general? No, I don't think the, the the growth rate uniformly throughout the field with FUE is as good as it is with FUT. Uh, let's say you needed a lot of graphs. Well, let's say you needed 3,500, 4,000 graphs. What protocol would you use to get your hair back? Uh, I would go for strip. I mean, I am a patient and I did have surgery and I chose to have a strip procedure because I wanted what I felt were the best quality grafts available. Uh, and I had did my procedures and, and I still have plenty of hair left, either for another strip procedure or an FUE procedure. And would you recommend um, the same protocol for a family member, a loved one, or a friend? Or would you send them for an FUE mega session? So long as they're not a head shaver and they have appropriate appropriate scalp and, and donor hair characteristics, my default is, is always FUT first, followed by FUE.